say thanks to all of our musicians and all who kind of jumped in different roles and stuff today. It's one of those Sundays when months out and someone says, oh, I think I, I'm going to be out of town on this Sunday. Okay, thanks. Someone else says, well, I'm going to be out of town. Oh, okay. And then you get a surprise. Oh, they're out of town as well. When four out of the seven normal kind of band members are gone and then you kind of go, oh, and then they're going to go there and they're going to, I tell you, God has blessed us over the years of bringing people in who can kind of just say, sure, I can move over to this instrument and play it. They make me sick. <sighs> I hate them, but I love them at the same time. Is that possible? I don't think that's supposed to be the way it works, but we are glad you're here today. We are concluding uh, our series that we started a few weeks ago, called, uh, weeks ago called Divine Direction. Now, in a couple weeks, I think about two weeks, we're going to start a new series. And the title of it is going to be Altars. We're going to look through scripture for a good number of weeks on certain moments in, in the Bible where altars were established. And what they meant for, for the people in that day and time and what they mean for us today. And we're going to look at things like covenant and, and celebration and, and new beginnings and God's sovereignty and prayer and worship and those types of things. We believe that God is going to speak to us as we jump into that series dealing with altars in our life. I hope that you will commit to join with us each Sunday for that new series that we're going to jump into. That's just going to be in a couple Sundays. But today, like I said, we're going to finish up our series on divine direction. And this is my prayer for us today. My prayer is that God will stir something, will stir something in us to maybe take us in a direction personally that he wants us to go, that we'll take the steps of faith, maybe it's away from what you do now or how you think or the situations you are in, stepping away from those th things and stepping in the direction that God wants you to go. I've said this before, and maybe you remember, but to step towards God's calling, to step towards the destiny God has for us, many times we have to step away from our security in life. We have to step away from what's most comfortable in our life. Sometimes God, in his plan for us, nudges us. Some of us, he wants to push really hard because we're stubborn, aren't we? Yeah, sometimes I'm in that boat. But God wants us to continually follow after Him and the plan that He has for us. Sometimes we have to step towards something different, something new. Sometimes we have to step away from what I am comfortable with. God, this is how I've done my life for whatever number of years. I know the rhythm of it, but God, you're asking me to do something else for your kingdom or serve in a different way or challenge how I do life. Sometimes you have to step away from securities of the old into the newness, into the freshness that God has for us. I believe that as we've been seeking for God's direction in our life, I believe God might call you to start something new. That God might start you in a new direction. It might be for some of you, that God has put something on your heart to change careers and you are going to be challenged to go start school again. <laughs> Some of you, that ain't me. Be careful what you say. God may be challenge you. God may be challenge you to start over a relationship that has lost trust. Maybe you are here today and God is going to challenge you to start, I'm going to be honest with you, rehab. Because maybe there's something in your life that is addictive and you've tried but you can't Get over it, but it's time to take the new start. Maybe it's a new job. Maybe it's a new ministry. Maybe it's tithing. Maybe it's joining a, a life group or a ministry group. Maybe it's time to start a business that God has put on your heart. I don't know what it is going to mean, but I believe God is always looking for those who are willing to listen to Him and follow Him by faith and sometimes step into something new 
where he's guiding us. I want to start with saying a couple of things that are pretty obvious. I'm going to say them, and they're very true. They're not in your notes, but just, just to listen. The challenge for so many of us, it's often the start that stops us. It's the start that stops us from doing anything. You look online, you see that... You see the ad, that person that lost 212 pounds. You see the before and after pictures. Remember, you, know, you see those pictures, you go, well, she weighed 212 at this point, and now six months later she weighs 106 in a size 2. Hate and love at the same time again, right? And you're like, how in the world do they do that? I wish I could do that. Man, if I could do that, I'd feel so much better. But we never start we don't know what to even do. The start stops us completely. The second obvious thought before we jump into our passage today. You will never, say never. You will never finish something that you don't start. Did you catch that? You will never finish something that you don't start. I'm praying that God gives us the faith to move in the direction for our course of life. To look at that, we're going to look in the Old Testament. We're going to look at the character Nehemiah this morning. Let me give you a little backstory. If you're not familiar with Nehemiah and his story, maybe you grew up in church or maybe you didn't. Maybe you grew up in church and never heard much about him. A little bit of his backstory. Well, God had basically told his people basically told them, I want you to obey me and I want you to worship me. Unfortunately, God's people did not obey and they did not worship him. So God allowed the Babylonian people to come in to destroy and to demolish everything that mattered to God's people. The Babylonians, they wiped out the temple... They destroyed the walls, they burned most of the city, and they took God's people into captivity. Really good day for God's people. Let's learn from that, just a little side note. Let's obey and let's worship God. In the past, he said, obey and worship me, and they chose not to. See what happened? Folks, especially in the day and time we live, we better obey, and we better worship the one true living God. It is the most important thing we do every single day of our lives. But the Babylonians came in and did all of this. 140 years have gone by. Can you imagine 140 years? But a small group, a remnant of people, they go back to their homeland. And they look around and they say pretty much... Phew, we need to rebuild this. But they get discouraged. They're, they're embarrassed. They're humiliated. Things aren't going anywhere. And suddenly God gives one man. Sometimes it just takes one person. One man named Nehemiah. He gives him what we're going to call a divine burden. He looks at what's going even from a city that is so far away and says, you know what? This is not okay. This is God's place. We are God's people. We can't allow this to happen anymore. As long as I'm alive, we've got to do something about this. A divine burden. You may be here this morning and you know what that God-given burden on your heart is. You may be here this morning and God has given you this burden, but you just may not have realized it yet. It's that thing that you look on in life, that thing in culture that you look on and you say, this just isn't right because I'm a follower of God, because God's Spirit lives within me, because I have the heart of God beating within me. I can't sit by and let these things go on. And you say to yourself, Somebody's got to do something about it, and it might as well be me. I've seen this over and over and over again in church world. For us, one story, Danny and Laura Ferguson. They're one of those ones. They're in California. 
Hi, Danny and Laura. California. A few years ago, they had a heart of burden for those who are homeless in our area. You know what we did? We started a life group. Helping the homeless, I believe, was the actual name of it. Some people kind of gathered together just to figure out ways, how can we help those who are homeless? You know what that started? That started other people saying, well, what about this group of people? What about how can we help here? And what can we do? And it has grown and it has developed and more and more people have joined with it. Now it is our outreach ministry of the church. It was born out of a divine, God-given burden. Your divine burden, it often reveals your divine direction that God has for you. Your heart, it aches. Your heart hurts on behalf of God, and that reveals something that He might want you to do. I don't know what it is for you, but maybe you're a guy here, and maybe for years you struggle with pornography. Maybe it was the sin that tripped you up over and over and over again, but you became honest with some people and God helped you and you've overcome and now you've moved on and you have this freedom. You know what it could be for you? It could be that you are the next person who joins up with another group of men that are struggling with that sin and that struggle and that addiction and you help them move to freedom that God has shown you. Maybe it's you hate the tragedy in our area of children without a home. And if you could, you would open up your home and you'd be a foster parent to all of them, but you can't do that. But maybe it's just the one that gets things started. Maybe it's the one that you make a difference in their life. Your burden will reveal the direction that God has for your life. This is what happened with Nehemiah. Nehemiah had, I think I've used this phrase before, a Popeye moment. You know, he popped the spinach. Some of our younger people don't know who Popeye is. He says, it's all I can stand and I can't stand no more. The Popeye moment. Maybe it's time for some of us to have that moment. Say, God, you have given me this burden and it is time that I start. It is time that I take the next step in this direction that you are revealing to me. What's interesting, when you look at Nehemiah and who he is, I consider him to be one of the least likely to be able to build a wall. There's Nehemiah, and I'm down here in least likely. He's least likely to build a wall. He wasn't a construction guy. He wasn't a general contractor. You know what his job was? He was a cup bearer. You know what his job called him to do? His job was to taste the wine before giving it to the king. Honestly, this was not a great job because his job was to test if it was poisoned. That's your job. You could die today, every single moment. So if the cupbearer dies, king, um, <clears throat> we're going to pass on that one today. So uh, new cupbearer, please. A guy that doesn't seem to be prepared for the task that's ahead. But he has a burden. I can picture him wondering, who am I? Pfft, who am I to do something about this? you may feel the same way. God, who am I? Who am I to to receive this burden, this passion that you've put on my heart to do this thing for you? Who am I? It doesn't seem like, God, I am very prepared to do this. But if God gives you the burden, He trusts you to do something about it. In the book of James on Wednesday nights, we've been studying his book about things we need to do. One of the the topics was faith without action, without works is, do you know what it says? Is dead. You know, works 
They don't save us. Doing good doesn't save us. We are saved by faith. But our faith should cause us to do good works. Our faith should cause us to live different. Our faith should cause us to receive the divine burden that God placed upon our hearts and do something about it. Don't let a divine burden from God die with you. Don't let it die with you. God's given it to you, and He trusts you to do something with it. First thing that Nehemiah does, if you look at the passage, he takes it to God. He gets down on his knees and he prays a powerful prayer. I'm going to let you read it on your own. I'm just going to summarize it. It's Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 5. But he says pretty much this, Lord God of heaven, you are great and you are awesome. Let your ear be attentive to the cries of my heart. He confesses sins of his own and of the nation and how wickedly they acted towards him. He says, remember the promises you gave your people and grant your servant success today as I go before the king. What's the first thing we need to do when God gives us a burden? We need to go to God in prayer. He says, God, give me favor before the king. Can you picture going to the king? King, I know this sounds crazy. Um, would you bless me and grant me access so I can leave um, the, the town of Susa where we are and travel 850 miles to Jerusalem, a cupbearer, and try to start this rebuilding project to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem to, you know, redeem the reputation of the city, to redeem the reputation of our God amongst the other nations. Would you give me the favor, O king, to do this? The king's heart is moved, and he grants him his request. It brings us to a question of how do you, as a follower of Jesus, with a divine burden, how do you start something that you might see as big? How do you start something big for God? You know, let, let's quantify that word big for a moment. Big may be just starting a ministry group. Big may be serving somewhere. Big may be starting a business. It might be paying off your student loans. It may be getting a life group together. It may be a, being a godly husband, a godly father. When I'm talking about big, what I'm asking is, what is it that God is calling you to do that is significant? What is it that's significant about your life that God is asking you to do? How do you start to do something significant, something big for God? First thing we're going to learn from Nehemiah in your notes is this. How do you do something big for God? You start small. You start small. You know, in the passage in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10, I love the passage. It says, Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Do not despise. Do, do not be embarrassed by. Do not be ashamed by starting something that we think might be so, small because the Lord himself looks down on that and he's going, you know what? Yeah! He rejoices just to see the work begin, just to see you start to follow in the direction that he has set for you. Perfect analogy is, is those of us who have had children, especially when they're little, you know, you love to see them crawl, and then they start to climb, and then they start to learn to walk. You may be the most dignified, most respectable, most appropriate parent that there ever was, or you just may be boring, a, a stick in the mud, or whatever frame you are, but if you see your child or your grandchild, grandparents I think are worse nowadays, or your grandchild learn to walk, and they start to do the Frankenstein. You remember when your kids used to do that? You got videos. What do you do as moms and dads? <laughs> yes! They 
they took their first step. You go crazy. Why? Because your kid took their first step. Now what happens after they take that first step? What do they do? Fall. Normally they don't go very far and normally they fall. And do you as a parent, do you go, well, that's pathetic. <laughs> you are your mother's child. <laughs> Horrible. Can't believe you even tried that. Do we do that? No. What do we say? Get back up. Come on, let's keep on trying. Let's take another step. Let's keep on doing this. Why? Because you rejoice to see the first step taken. And this is what God sees and what he does whenever we have a burden that he's placed upon us and we start to take the steps, even though we may not see the details Suddenly in our spiritual walk, we're kind of doing the Frankenstein. I'm not sure exactly, but God says, I am so proud of you. I'm rejoicing over you because you took a step of faith. We think of Nehemiah. Kind of we just think of the end of the story. Oh, yeah, he had a burden. They built the wall. Good job, good job. What's interesting, though, if you kind of start at the end of his story and make some steps backwards, it's really encouraging to us. At the end of the story, they built a wall. If you go back a few steps, you know what they did? They worked their tails off. You know, if God gives you a burden, there's going to be some work involved. It's not always going to be easy. It's going to be hard. There's going to be questions, there's going to be stress, you're going to hurt, you're going to ache. But they worked. Take another step back. The text actually talks about they worked with a tool in one hand. Do you remember what the passage just said? And a weapon in the other hand. Because opposition was coming against them. If you take another step back, do you know what they started to do? They worked their tails off. Again, take another step back. Someone had to have the courage to set the first stone. Go a little step farther back. You'll see Nehemiah rallying the people, the people who didn't believe that it could be done. You know what he said? Fight for your brothers. Fight for your sisters. Fight for your children. Fight for your God. He motivates the people that we can do something significant for God. You take another step back. Nehemiah is investigating by night. He's looking and he's seeing, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? You take another step back. He waits for three days in the passage. You take another step back. You see he has traveled about 850 miles, probably on a donkey. I think we know part of the reason why he might have waited three days. Go another step back. He packed his bag. Packed his toothbrush and went on. If you want to do something significant, something big for God, you start small. You have the faith to start. Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. This is what he did. He gathered all the chief officials around him, the priests, the nobles, and this is what he said. You see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. This is a burden. Says its gates have been burned by fire. And watch what he does. He says, come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I told them all about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king said to me. And they replied, you know, can we all just say this together of what their reply was? They replied, say it with me, let us start rebuilding. Just hold on one second. I don't know what in your life is all messed up. I don't know what in your life you feel like the walls have crumbled, the temple's torn down, everything is just horrible in this season of life. Maybe it's today you say to God, let us start rebuilding. 
let us start. And they begun this good work. And what did God do? He rejoiced to see the work had begun. You want to do something significant with your life? Have the faith to start small. Even when you don't know the details. Remember last week, if you were here last week, the Spirit's prompting some certain uncertainty. This is number two, point number two. Actually, not point number two, just some in your notes. I want you to remember this phrase. You don't have, you don't have to have the faith to finish. You just have to have the faith to start. You don't have to have the faith that says, I can see all the way to the very end. I know exactly how it's going to come out at the end. Most of the time in this life, you just have to have the faith to put down the first stone, per se, like Nehemiah. You don't have to know all the details. Remember, God won't give you all of the details. He leads you in his direction step by step. You may not understand what the finished outlook is going to be, but you have the faith just to take the first step. I posted the picture a while back of a 2009 summer Sunday morning. It's been a while with all of our travelers today. There's a lot more in here today than we're here on that summer. 2009 Sunday morning. Posted on Facebook a while back. This message today means something to me. When the Ogles came here, kids' ministry, I think, doubled. Jack was the nursery, I believe, at that point in time. When Pastor Tim came a few years into this journey we've been on, now, if I'm almost 100% correct, kind of the, the consistency of the Wednesday night youth teens that were really there was Big Seth, Logan, Sean. When worship would happen on that first few little bit of time, James, I believe, was on the keyboard. Miss Ruby was on a piano. And Otis Gettings, sweet Otis Gettings, who has passed away, was playing his guitar. small beginnings. If you step by step by step, I am blown away what God has done through this local body, how he's brought people into our area. Let me tell you, our staff, I'll put them up against anybody. I don't care the church size they are. For us and about 140 that we are, I would put them up against anybody. God blesses faithfulness to at least take in the first step. You want to do something significant? You start small. Well, I didn't say think small. There's a big difference. I didn't say think small. You might have to start small, but you're always thinking big and grand for God. You're thinking, oh, my God is awesome and is great, and I'm going to do everything I can to Make his kingdom great. Start small. Don't let the start stop you. Second thing in your notes. It's a tough one. For all of you, those who guess ahead of time on filling in the blanks, I know you're out there. You take the next Suckers, you take the next step. This is what Nehemiah did. Chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. They started to have some opposition on rebuilding this wall. The bad guys show up on the scene. It says, but when Sambalot, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard about this, they mocked and ridiculed us. Here last week, remember, 
The Spirit's prompting. There's some certain uncertainty. There's some predictable resistance. They're moving in God's direction, and they receive a little bit of resistance. They're asking, what is this you're doing to, to Nehemiah and them? Are, are you rebelling against the king? He said, I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. What do you do? You just take the next step that God guides you on. You might have to start small, but then you just take another step. And then you take another step, and God provides, and God guides you, and you take step after step after step. I don't know what it might mean for you. Maybe it is you want to lose a little bit of weight. Maybe it's 20 pounds you would love to, to lose. Maybe your first step is actually on the treadmill. And then the other foot goes on the treadmill, and you turn it on. And you start walking. You push away the chocolate donuts. Oh, the chocolate donuts are so good. But maybe you push it away. You start to feel better about yourself and you're healthy. Maybe it's time to get out of debt. Maybe debt truly is snared around you. And we've talked about through Dave Ramsey's classes, trying to get that $1,000 emergency fund. How in the world am I going to get a $1,000 emergency fund? Well, you don't go out to eat all the time. You don't drink Starbucks all the time. You sell something on eBay, have a big old yard sale, and you are good ways on your way to getting that done. Step after step after step. Don't let the start scare you. Don't let starting something hold you back because you're afraid, you're unsure. Don't let the start stop you. Maybe you know you need to be closer to God and you just drifted. Maybe you're distracted by the things of this world and you are challenged to constantly be in a relationship with Him. Start small. Get a Bible reading app, a Bible plan, find something. Seek God when you get up in the mornings. Pray. Find a life group, find a Sunday school class, find a ministry group here at the church and connect with them. I'm going to tell you, when you connect with people, something starts to happen. You know what happens next when you start to connect with people? You start to get to know their name. You start to get involved in a ministry. You know what? One day you'll have a I Love My Church t-shirt and you'll wear it and you'll become one of us. So you start small. You take a step. Don't let the start stop you. I love what St. Francis of Assisi said. It's in your notes. Start doing what's necessary, then what's possible, and suddenly you're doing the impossible. Start doing what's necessary. Next step, what's possible. Next step, see God work through you for the impossible. Nehemiah had a divine burden that gave him a divine direction. He just had to take a 